Don't be hung by your tongue. In 1999, don't be hung by your tongue. Everybody say this. Don't be hung by your tongue. One more time. Don't be hung by your tongue. One more time and point to your mouth. Don't be hung by your tongue. My text is Proverbs 3, 13. Happy is the man, notice, that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Brothers and sisters, in 1999, we need to become God-possessed. How can you get God-possessed? A good question. Well, I have the answer for you. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not upon thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths in 1999. Do you want to walk with God? Well, you have to make a quality decision. You see, life is made up of decisions. The Word of God says, As a man thinketh in his heart. Everybody point here. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible also says, Out of the abundance of the heart. Come along here. I want to get you part of this sermon. You got a hand up there? Yeah. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What does that scripture teach us? It teaches us that your heart controls your mouth. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? I've had a fourfold prayer for you, dear ones. Fourfold. Two negative things and two positive things. I've been praying this for every single one of you. Throughout the day, I would pray this. The Lord would come by His wonderful presence and get all over me and I would pray this prayer. David prayed this prayer. This is not my prayer. It's David's prayer. In Psalm 17 verse 3, I purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. David cried out. He said, Lord, you've tried me. You've tested me. I have purposed in my heart that I'm not going to sin with my mouth. Second thing, suffer not or permit not my mouth to cause my flesh to sin. Ecclesiastes 5, 6. Suffer not, permit not your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Church, it's time we cry out to God from the depths of our heart that we will not sin with our mouth and we will not cause our mouth to cause our flesh to sin. We want to be holy people. I prayed to God, I said, church, Lord, let not this church sin with their mouth and sin with their mouth and cause their flesh to sin. That's the cry of my heart for you. I don't want you to sin. 
I don't want you to mock God. And the second aspect of my prayer was God, please. Please, God, make this people God like and Christ like. Amen. We need to have the fear of God upon us. Quit trying to be somebody else. Be like the Lord Jesus. Be godly. Be holy. Be righteous. Live pure, clean, and holy. Sure, a faint amen. Is that the best you can do? Or do you want to go on sinning and fall in the ditch? I'm earnest about what I'm saying. This is not a sermon, this is a message that's burned in my heart. God wants a holy people. God wants a people that don't sin with their mouth and don't cause their flesh to sin. I don't know about you. I don't know how long my candle is. Some of you are young, your candle is longer. I don't know how many days I've got left. But I'll tell you, I want the remaining days of my life to be pure and clean and holy. I want Jesus to shine through me. Amen. I don't want to be a tail bearer. I don't want to pick up other people's I have to answer to God. Every man has to answer to God. How are we going to live in 1999? Are we going to fall and... And, and just live for the devil and pick up every else, everybody else's offense. God help you. You're causing your flesh to sin. You're causing your mouth to sin. David prayed. He said, God, you've tried me over and over again. And I purpose that I will not sin against you with my mouth. Does that mean anything to you? I heard on the television here, I don't know, it's two or three days ago, and I don't often look at the television, I, I look at the weather, and my wife is always bugging me, she says, do I have to listen to that again and again and again? Well, let's just permit me at least a break. And then I switch that television to another station and they were talking about Belize. And while they were talking about Belize, they said there's a Mennonite community down there about 1,400 people. And they were interviewing this gentleman and other individuals. And this fellow said there are over 70 different kinds of Mennonites. I didn't know that. They're almost as bad as the Pentecostals. <laughs> 70 different kinds of Mennonites. That's interesting. And this reporter, he says, what kind of a Mennonite are you? He says, there are many Mennonites, but I am a Mennonite. When I say yes, I mean yes. And when I say no, I mean no. Did you know that the Bible talks about that verse? In St. Matthew 5, verse 37, but let your communication be what? The way you live and walk. Let your communication be what? Yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh from evil. Thank God. If there's no Pentecostals, there's a few Mennonites. 
thank God for the Mennonites. That Mennonite man said, when I say no, I mean no. And when I say yes, I mean yes. Have we got anybody like that in the church today? Anybody in this congregation? When you say yes, you mean yes. You don't mean no. And whatsoever else is not is sin. Have you ever read, it, read Ecclesiastes 5 2? Ecclesiastes 5 2 means let your words be few. I speak to you whoever said that the more you speak makes you important who wants to listen to you all the time anyway <laughs> this is my wife here Sometimes she comes to me and she says, why don't you talk to me? Well, I tell her, please, I just want to be alone. I want to be silent. Amen. You know, there's wonderful benefit just to keep your mouth shut and say nothing. Did you know that? You know, there's four kinds of people in this world. Did you know that? Four kinds of people. Put your four fingers up. I don't have it on this hand, so I have to put, you, put this hand up. See, there are those that multiply you, and there are those that divide you, and there are those that subtract to you, and there's those that add to you. What kind of a person are you? Are you the one that divides or the one that subtracts? God help you, please. If you're one that divides and you're the one that subtracts, may God give you the grace to multiply and add. Amen. Be quiet. Let your words be few. And then when you open your mouth, you'll have something wonderful to say. Praise God Almighty. Amen. Glorify Him. Did you know that God has given every one of you two gifts? Everybody here has two gifts. Lift your two fingers. I want you to work a bit today. Amen. Why should I do it all? <clears throat> One of those gifts is that little door under your nose called your mouth. That's a wonderful gift from God. The other gift that God has given you is the wonderful Word of God, the Bible. Two marvelous, wonderful gifts. You know, what you do with those two gifts are going to either make you or break you. How many have heard of the great Martin Luther, the great reformer? Well, some of you have. You know what Martin Luther said? And I have it written in my Bible. The Bible will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Amen. Amen. How can you keep from sinning? How can you be pure and clean and holy before God? I thank God I have an answer. The psalmist David said, Thy word 
Amen. The Bible, the Word of God. Hide it away in your heart that you don't sin against Him. Did you know that the Bible is sin proof, devil proof, demon proof? Some of these Pentecostals, they get me upset. Pray for me. They're always talking about the devil. Have you ever seen the devil, Brother Steve? No, I don't want to see him. <laughs> we have parted from him. Amen. Some people have such weird, you know, you've got a spider on your back. That's a demon. I saw him sitting there. Did you know it? Wonderful news, isn't it? That really lifts you up, doesn't it? That really makes you spiritual, doesn't it? Goodness sakes. What kind of people are we? Are we keeping company with the devil? Or are we really tapped into God? Amen. Amen. I thank God for the Bible. I thank God I can hide it away in my heart. And by the grace of Almighty God, I can live an overcoming life. I don't have to be a victim. There's all kinds of victims in the church today. Walking around, getting everybody's attention. Nobody has to be a victim. You know why? The victor is inside. All you have to do is let him out. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I'm getting loud now. Yes. The devil has victimized you long enough. It's time you to tell him to get off your back and go to hell where he belongs. Amen. And I'm not swearing either. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Brother, take the word of God. That's what Jesus dealt with the devil. He told the devil is written, get behind me. And what did the devil do? He took his flight. Get the devil off your back. If you can't do it, come up here and I'll knock him off. I'll knock him off in the name of Jesus and he'll go. Amen. The name of Jesus is still all powerful. Brothers and sisters, please, take the word of God and put it into your heart. Amen. And I'll tell you, it'll guard you from depression and oppression, obsession, depression, all the D's. How, want to be, how many want to be free from all the D's? Yes. Well, I've got, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm depressed. Would you want to be free? That's the whole question. You know, some people just like to be miserable and depressed all the time. Pray for me, I'm depressed, brother. Anoint me with oil. Pour it on. Set me free. I'm not trying to mock anybody. But if you really want to be free, you can be free. Amen. Whom the Son sets free is free. Not only free, but free indeed. Amen. My Bible says that Jesus has come to give us life. Not only life, but more abundant life. Number two, the tongue controls your life. Did you know? The tongue. You know, we confess salvation with our mouth, right? If thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth, you can be saved. Did you know that God has given every one of us creative abilities with this wonderful gift called the mouth? Words are very important 
and they're powerful. They're creative. Did you know that? How many people don't realize the power they have in the tongue? Listen to me. You be very careful what you're creating. You better think twice when you open your mouth and what you talk, what you are creating. Some of these motor mouth people, they even talk in the night. They don't even shut it off. <laughs> How many want to keep out of trouble? I have a formula for you. It works every single time. My Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they're going to see God. He doesn't invoke any blessing on the troublemakers. Thank God. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Whoso keepeth his mouth, notice, and his tongue keepeth his soul from trouble. We had a pastor in India. And this guy would come. And he was one of those guys that picked up everybody else's offense. If there was trouble, he was there. He would find the trouble. Even if he had to take the bus 100 miles, he'll find the trouble. <laughs> he used to come and visit me. And... I would say to myself, here comes Mr. Trouble. Picked up everybody's offense. Thought I was a garbage can, so he'd pour it all on me. And I got sick and tired of this. And I said to him one day, I said, Pastor, don't you ever come and see me again unless you've got something good to tell me. Please go home. Sometime later, I went out to visit him because he didn't come and see me. <laughs> and I was wondering why he wouldn't come and see me. There must be a reason. So I went and I called on him. He wasn't in the man, so I walked around the church and there he was smoking a big, thick beady, like a mini cigar. And as soon as he saw me, I said, oh, he says, you caught me. I said, I didn't catch you. You were doing it all the time. <laughs> he says, you know, Pastor, I was cold and I had to light that cigar to warm myself up. <laughs> I gave him 30 days and he'd have to quit the, the budding habit or leave the ministry. But I didn't do it. I turned him over to some Indian brothers. And they said, you know, we were thinking of the same thing. We'll give him 30 days. And they gave him 30 days and God dealt with him in a wonderful way. And you know what happened? He learned to control the little door under his nose God sanctified his tongue and his mouth and he didn't have to smoke the beady anymore to keep him warm. Isn't God good? I like walking around. Uh, Brother Larry. <laughs> One, what's, uh, I'm going to say two things. I want you to let me know what you like best. 
I love you, Larry. I absolutely hate you. That's easy. I love you. You must be normal. <laughs> I'm trying to illustrate something here. You know, there's a lot of destruction going on in the church today and in the world. I want you to purpose this morning. I want you to make a quality decision. You are not going to be hung by your tongue any longer. You have the ability to control it. Did you know that? You've been hung long enough by your tongue. God wants you to say a prayer. I'll say it and I want you to repeat it. Dear Lord, please help me from today on that I will not be hung by my tongue. Amen. You know God can hear that prayer. Amen. God can hear that prayer. Instead of being hung with your tongue, you can start using your tongue. <laughs> I went to a funeral here not so long ago. In fact, it, uh, Pastor Tim and myself were involved in this funeral. And I think Gary was there also at that funeral. Some months ago, we were together at a funeral. You were playing also. And uh, we went to this funeral and I was talking to different people that went to the funeral, you know, just in preparation for the funeral. And uh, I overheard a conversation uh, between two men. They said, you know, we really have to think before we go in there. We have to say something really good and encouraging to those people that lost their loved one. <laughs> and I thought about that. We not only, when we go to a funeral, is that the only time we can say something encouraging? Something that lifts up when somebody dies? I think we ought to have our conversation seasoned with salt at all times. Not only when a, a catastrophe comes, when God plucks a loved one away, that we start really thinking and getting our act together, maybe we should say something that will comfort them and lift them up. I thought about that. <clears throat> Proverbs 10, 19 to 20. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but notice, he that refraineth his lips is wise. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. Proverbs 12 verse 18. There is that speaketh like a piercing sword. But the tongue, notice, of the wise is what? Truth. you want to be a fool or do you want to be wise? You know, a fool can't say anything good. Did you know that? Only the wise tongue can say that which is good. Amen. God doesn't want you to be a donkey, an idiot. God wants you to be a believer, 
a child of God that's going to say something good. And if you can't say something good, please. Yes. You finish it. Don't say anything bad. That really makes sense, doesn't it? Young Samuel, in 1 Samuel 3, 19, the Bible says, and Samuel grew, notice, and the Lord was with him and did not let none of his words fall to the ground. May God give us many hundreds of Samuels in this house that when you open your mouth, your words are not going to fall to the ground. They're not going to be dead words. They're not going to be death. You know, we have the capacity to either speak life or death. Did you know? Samuel was a man that spoke life. Hallelujah. Let me encourage you here. Start in a small way. Right here this morning. I want to put this to practice. Just lean over and touch somebody and bless them in the name of Jesus. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Well, bless me, Samuel. No, you're not blessing anybody. Well, bless me. I'll take a blessing. Amen. Bless you. Give me your hand. Bless you, brother. I love you. What did that cost you? That cost you nothing. You know, church, listen to me. God has given us the ability to minister life or death. Let me encourage you, please. Please. Amen. Don't be hung by your tongue. But there's only one way that you can do that. You have to make quality decisions. You have to think before you open your mouth. Did you know that? A lot of people open their mouth and all kinds of garbage comes out. Proverbs 12, 6. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for their blood. But notice the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? If you've got your Bibles, I would like you to turn with me to Proverbs 18, 6 to 8. Notice, a fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. Do you know that was in the Bible? You can hit a man and knock him cold with your words. Did you know that? I didn't make that up. You know, the devil has lied to the whole world. And everybody's picked it up and they didn't even have to learn it. You know what it is? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You never learned that. How'd you pick it up? I can't remember spending an hour learning that. Did you? That's the biggest lie from hell. I tell you, church, I would sooner have the sticks and stones than the blows that come from people's mouths. That's a fact. You can hit somebody and wound them forever. 
I did a foolish thing and I'm confessing it here this morning. When I was in Bible college, we were studying philosophy and psychology. And this professor, he was teaching us well, so I thought I would put to practice what he was teaching us. So one day at breakfast time, I went to a sister and I said to her sister, my, you look pale this morning. How come you didn't, did you have a rough night, sister? You look awful pale. And I arranged that about 10 other guys would come along and say something similar. Did you know that by dinner time, we had to rush that sister to the hospital in an ambulance? We almost lost her. She almost died. Did you know that? The whole school was fasting and praying. for this gag. The principal got a hold of me, found out who arranged it, and he took me for a ride in the car, and he says, you dare do this again and you will get the right hand of fellowship. <laughs> I'm bringing that as an example of the importance and the power, the creating power of words. A lot of people don't realize what comes out of their mouth is so important. What kind of a 1999 do you want? Number three, keep guard on your heart. Proverbs 4, 20 to chapter 5, 2. God's word is saying... Why don't you learn my ways? How many are teachable here today? How many know it all? You know, we have those that know it all. You can't teach them anything. I thank God I am teachable. I can sit at anybody's feet and learn. If you're teachable, you're reachable. Amen. Proverbs 4.20 says, My son, notice, attend to my words and incline the ear to my sayings. Now, if you really want to know how to change your heart, this is it right here. You say, well, Brother Steve, help me. I'm here to help you. By the grace of God, I want to help you. If you're in need in this area, I want to help you. I want you to be set free and leave this house and this service absolutely free. How many want help here? Let's be honest. If we're honest, we should lift both hands. Let's be honest. We have the answer here. Proverbs 4.21 Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Amen. We've covered it already in a sense. Brothers and sisters, take the words of wisdom. Amen. Amen. Put them right down in the middle of your heart. Keep them there. Guard them in the name of Jesus. Why? Proverbs 4, 22 to 24 says, For they are life unto them that find it, and health to all their flesh, Keep thy heart, notice, with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Put them away. Far from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips. Put them far from thee. What's he saying? 
What he's trying to tell us is how we can control our life and live godly and holy. Or do you want to just do your own thing? Well, I'll tell you. I'm glad I'm sick and tired of doing my own thing. I now want to listen to him. He's telling us how. We can control our life, live godly, live holy, be salt and be light. How do you establish your ways? You do it with your mouth. Number four, we are ministers, listen to me, of life and not death. We are builders and not destroyers. God bless my wife to two, with two beautiful daughters. Sharon and Myrna. We love these girls. We, we did our absolute best to be a father and a mother to them. And you know, Myrna and Sharon didn't become young ladies overnight. It took a period of 19 or 20 years to shape these lives with God's wonderful care and keeping. But you know, just one bad act can ruin them all. Are you a builder? Or are you a destroyer? It takes years to build. This house has been here now for 20 some, 25 years. It's taken a lot of prayer and fasting and giving and everybody putting their shoulder to the thing. What are we going to do now? Are we going to destroy it? God help you. You think about that for a little while. Are you a builder, minister of life or death? I have a verse that God planted in my heart. I was going through a battle unknown to my wife. I don't go around telling everybody my woes and my aches and my pains. I don't go around licking my wounds. And I don't ask anybody else to lick my wounds either. Because they might have a poisonous tongue. And I might get affected. Infected. If you don't get anything else out of this message this morning, I want you to put this verse, put 20 circles around it, somehow put the reference down if you haven't got your Bible here because this is a very important verse. God brought peace to my heart and to my mind through this verse. I didn't go around looking for a prophecy for somebody. Have you got a word for me? And I'm not against that because I believe in prophecy myself. But I'll tell you, I've got a more sure word of prophecy for you. It's found in Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. I'll tell you, that laid me low. I dropped to my knees right there and I repented, I tell you. I said, God, please forgive me. Because corrupt communication did come out of that little door under my nose. And I said, God, please. And it's my prayer for you too. I've got a second prayer for you today. 
Can you handle another little prayer? I'll tell you, I'm earnest with what I'm saying. I'm not trying to down anybody here. I'm, I'm trying to help you. Because I may not get another chance to preach in this church for a long time. And when I get a chance, I like to make it count. <laughs> Only let those things come out of your mouth that are going to edify, that are going to build somebody else up. Yeah. Only one, two amens. How many other, any other amens here? Yeah. Everybody should be shouting and on their feet. Literally. That's what we're here for. Amen. We're builders. We want to build somebody else up. Amen. There's too many people down there. For Jesus' sake, lift them up. Hallelujah. Don't put your foot on his neck already. He's trying to get up. Don't kill him. You can give that poor fellow life or you can kill him. The Bible says we have the power of death and life in our tongue. What, do you want to assassinate him? Devastate him forever that he can't lift his head? Or do you want to lift him up and love him? Because I'll tell you, brother and sister, every single one of us here are subject to falling and failing. Nobody can wave their hands and say, well, you know, I'm a goody-goody. We are what we are only by the grace of Almighty God. Yes, Lord. And there's a good opportunity for me to put in a little bit of a, what do you call it? A sales pitch here. I'm going to be teaching, God willing, Tuesday night, a wonderful, wonderful course called Paul the Apostle of Grace. This is one of a kind. You're not going to get this kind of teaching ever in this city or anywhere else. This is one of a kind series. Not because I'm teaching it, but because God just gave it to us. And I want to share it with you. It'll cost you 30 bucks, around 30 bucks with the manual. We'll spend 10 nights together, three hours a night. And I will guarantee that by the time you finish those lessons, you will be completely changed. You will understand what the grace of God is. You know, there's a lot of people out there, they haven't got the vaguest idea what the grace of God is. That's a fact. Once you see the grace of God, you know what you want to do? You want to go out of your way. You want to go the second and third mile to help a brother or sister in need. You're not going to be waiting for somebody to call you. When the house is on fire, what do you do? You go and try and extinguish the flame, don't you? You don't wait until the guy is, is breathing his last breath and say, come and help me. That's what that series will help you. $30. And I tell you, church, it'll humble you. Amen. You'll cry out to God from the depths of your soul that you want to be a man and a woman of God. Quit poor-mouthing people. You know, the Bible says you can poor-mouth them or you can rich-mouth them. What do you want to do? The blessing of the Lord, Brother Larry, maketh rich. That's rich mouthing. I want to illustrate it to you so that you get the message. How do you rich mouth somebody? 
Come on. You bless him. Amen. Bless somebody for Jesus' sake. You might get a, a blessing back accidentally. Bless you, son. It's a blessing of God that makes us rich. Amen. And adds no sorrow. Hallelujah. There's no pain or ache. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we not bless? Do we have to poor mouth all the time? May God help us to start rich mouthing. Amen. May God help you to be rich mouthing and not poor mouthing anybody. How you doing, Larry? I'm doing all right. Awesome. I want to rich mouth you. Do you mind? Go ahead. God. God, pour it on him. Pour it on him, Lord. Pour it on him. Amen. We have a rich God, a wonderful God that loves you, Larry. And I want to bless you with all the blessings of my God in 1999. In Jesus' name. And I don't want to pour him out you anymore. I'm sick and tired of people poor mouthing. Which point am I on anyway? Uh, five? <laughs> it's wonderful. Proverbs 18.20 Notice a man's belly. Do this. Man's belly. This is where my belly is. I don't know where yours is. But mine's right here. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. How many like stories? Anybody like stories? My wife is here and she always tells me, she says, you don't know how to tell a story. <laughs> but I'm going to give it a best shot this morning. A young pastor gave a wonderful Bible study. And after the Bible study was finished, a 90-year-old man 90 year old man came up to this young minister and he said pastor see my head it's just curly it's black it's just like when I was a youth I'm 90 years old I don't think I've lost any hair look at my teeth I've got all my teeth Look at my eyes. I've got 20-20 vision. You are wearing glasses and I'm not, the 90-year-old man said. The pastor couldn't take it any longer. He says, well, what's the remedy for this? He says, I'm not finished. I'm 90 years old. And I haven't even got a hearing aid. My hearing is absolutely perfect. And not only that, he said to the young pastor, I have not even been in the hospital one day in all my 90 years. Finally, the pastor says, well, please tell me. He says, you know, young pastor, years and years and years ago, God spoke to me. If I could control the little door under my nose, I would be able to control all the rest of my body. He said to the young pastor, I'm 90 years old and my words are few. Do you want to lose your teeth? 
Do you want to lose your vision? Do you want to give up your hearing? Do you want to go to the hospital? Get intravenous and all the injections that go along with it? Follow the 90-year-old man's advice. Let your words be few. And I've got to wind this thing up too quick. Please turn with me quickly to Job 22, verse 28. Thou shalt also decree a thing, notice, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Thou shalt also decree a thing. Brothers and sisters, we have the capacity, every one of us, we can decree our future for 1998 with our mouth. What are you decreeing? What have you already decreed in the days that January has passed? You can say, well, you know, Brother Steve, I've had migraines for the last 10 years and I guess 1999 is going to be filled with migraines too. What are you doing? You're decreeing what you're going to have for 1999 migraines. You must enjoy them. Or you can decree in the name of Jesus that you're going to be a man and a woman of God. That you're going to only say those things that are going to edify and build up. You're not going to be a tearing down, but you're going to be a building up Christian. I want to decree over this house because I may not get a chance for a long time. I want to decree God-likeness and Christ-likeness over every single one of you. I want to decree that your walk and fellowship and manner of life with God will be godly and holy. I will declare in the name of Jesus no ifs or buts about you. Well, you know, he's a wonderful brother, but. She's a wonderful Christian, but. Who wants buts? Only goats but. <laughs> Let me decree in the name of Jesus the blessing of God that makes every one of you rich. I want a rich mouth you. I want a rich mouth your heart, your life, your home. Amen. Your business. I don't want to poor mouth anybody. God doesn't want you to have a, this a poverty poor syndrome. We're children of God. We're a child of a king. Let us walk with some dignity and some poise. Amen. God wants to dignify every single one of you and I want to decree it in the name of Jesus. Can you receive it or can't you? Sister, I want to decree something wonderful over you. Lord, I want to decree that this woman of God is going to rise up. Amen. And be counted for you in her home, in her community, in the house of God that many, many young women will follow in her footsteps. You're a godly young woman. You're a godly mother. The fear of God is in you, sister. God loves you so much. You're very precious to the heart of God. 
I bless you. In 1999, with God's innumerable blessings, in Jesus' name. I wish I had time to put my hand on every single one of you and bless you and decree the goodness of God on you. My heart aches. My heart aches. Now I'm getting emotional. Can I decree something else on you? I might as well just give you the full shot. I want to decree this morning that we're going to start loving one another. We're going to start loving one another as Christians. Amen. God is only asking one thing from you and I down here. He's asking us to love one another. And if we really love brother and sister, we're not going to poor mouth our brother and sister or the pastor or whoever. We got to blame, we got to poor mouth somebody. Well, if you can't poor mouth, don't go around looking for somebody to poor mouth. That's what the Pharisees did. They're always looking. They found a lady and they said, you know, we've caught her in the very act of adultery. What are you guys going to do about it? There's a lot of Christians running around in the church looking for faults and failures in people and exposing them. Brother and sister, God is asking this house for one thing only, and that is that we love one another. And I decree in the name of the Lord from today on, we're going to start loving one another as a family. Amen. And if one hurts, we're going to go over there and succor that one. Amen. amen. We're going to go and lift them up. We're not going to put them down. Amen. I said all that to say this. God wants you to be a whatsoever believer. Whatsoever believer. Everybody say, whatsoever believer. Well, whatso whatsoever a believer. What, what kind of a believer is that? Well, it's found in Philippians 4, 8. What does it say? Brothers and sisters, whatsoever is pure, holy, godly, all these wonderful things, think on these things. Be a whatsoever believer, amen. And I'll tell you, if you're a whatsoever believer, you know what you're going to do? I've got news for you. You're not going to be hung by your tongue in 1999. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We come to the end of this year and none of us are going to be hung by our tongue. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We close the year, amen with this wonderful gift that God has given to us called our mouth that we will be glorifying God and praising him. Amen. Blessing one another. Loving one another. Hallelujah. Lifting one another up. You know, whether we realize it or we don't, we are either plusing people or minusing. You don't even have to open your mouth. I want to plus every single one of you. 
I want you by the end of 1999 flourishing. Amen. Flourishing for God. <clears throat> Glorifying God as a family, as an individual, as a businessman, as a believer, as a brother in Christ. Flourishing. Thank you.